Welcome back to Beyond the Patterns. Today we have another invited speaker and I have the great pleasure to announce Isabel Valera. She is a full professor in machine learning at the Department of Computer Science at the University in Saarland in Saarbrücken, Germany and adjunct faculty at the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems in Saarbrücken. She is also a fellow of the European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligent Systems, ELIS, where she is part of the Robust Machine Learning Program and the Saarbrücken Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Unit. Prior to this, she was an independent group leader at the MPI for Intelligent Systems in Tübingen, Germany. She has held a German Humboldt postdoctoral fellowship and a Minerva Fast Track fellowship from the Max Planck Society. Professor Valera obtained her PhD in 2014 and Master of Science degrees in 2012 from the University Carlos Ferd in Madrid, Spain, and worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the MPI for Software Systems Germany and at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Today, it's a great pleasure to have her here and she will present on ethical machine learning, mind the assumptions. Isabel, I'm very glad to have you here and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. much for inviting me to be here today. Um, yes, and for the kind introduction and all my bio where I moved a lot. I hope I have settled a bit for now. Um, and as we were talking today, we are going to talk about machine learning and some ethical aspects. In particular, we will be talking about fairness and interpretability. And rather than putting a lot of um, focus on methodological approaches, I will mostly focus on assumptions and how technical assumptions uh, may actually trigger some problems if we don't uh, make them carefully. So just as a bit of motivation, uh, the context where I will be mostly discussing is uh, machine learning to inform what, we, what I call consequential decisions. And I call them consequential because I'm talking about settings in which the algorithm is um, supplementing or even replacing human supervision in decision-making processes that may have important consequences in people's life uh, or the individuals that they decide about. So for example, here, uh, we have some examples on pretrial veil, some of the pre, uh, some of the tools that are being used in the in the in the US are actually informed by uh, machine learning. So many of you might be familiar by now with the Compass dataset. We are also uh, considering settings like uh, credit approval or hiring processes where machine learning are um, becoming more and more uh, ubiquitous around there. And the questions that we are going to be uh, handling is actually, or the big question actually is how do we make sure that uh, these algorithms and the decisions that they make are aligned with human goals and values. And of course, when I talk about human goals and values, we are different uh, individuals in society. Each of us, we have a different role every time that, that we are embedded in, in this kind of decisions. And if you think of the owner of the algorithm, maybe uh, this individual is interested in making the algorithm um, precise, to have a good performance and therefore to maximize uh, the profit of the company that is developing it. While if you think on the society level or the regulator level, maybe people are worried more about whether uh, the algorithm is actually fulfilling existing laws, in particular, for example, discrimination laws, 
or if you look at the final user or consumer, consumer of the algorithm, which is um, the individual affected by the decision, they might be actually interested in understanding why the decision a decision was taken, and if such a decision was not positive towards them, why or how they can uh, change such a decision for, for example, next time they apply for a job. So this is basically uh, the setting that we are going to be working. And just to give you a bit of a high level overview, in general, in machine learning for decision making, the general setting is that we have some historical data where imagine we have a set of uh, applicants. And this set of applicants, we define them or characterize them by a set of features. And in the context of fairness, we often divide these features into sensitive, for example, race, gender, are usually considered sensitive features depending on the application domain. And then we have non-sensitive features like income, credit card, or previous loans. This is a setting for credit approval. And together with that, uh, we have some historical labels which actually uh, capture the outcomes of past decisions, um, indicating in this case, for example, whether they pay the, they repay the loan or they default. And the idea, of course, is that we aim to take a new applicant and given only the set of features, make a decision on whether we are gonna grant or not the loan. And we are gonna in general do that by making a prediction on whether they would repay. So this is where the algorithm comes in. So we use all this historical data to train an algorithm such that we can make a prediction on people uh, that we haven't seen before. So this is the general setting that most of machine learning for decision-making system considers. And as I was already um, mentioning at the beginning, we are gonna be uh, looking at this problem of decision making or consequential decision making for two from two perspectives. One of them, which is fairness. And in particular, we talk a lot about fairness, but most of the times we refer to, in particular, one type of unfairness, which is discrimination. And just to give you a very high level um, definition, uh, we are gonna define fairness as the ability to ensure that the outcomes of the algorithm do not systematically differ between individuals belonging to different social salient groups. And as I said before, social salient groups usually relate to people that share some given gender or race. And in general, these groups are defined by anti-discrimination laws. And it depends, of course, in the context in which we are applying machine learning. And of course, we are making decisions for individuals and about individuals. So, there is also, as you may know, this, uh, this right um, considered by the GDPR, the, the, the European uh, Law for, for Data Protection, which actually gives the right to individuals affected uh, by a decision to, to, ask, to ask for an explanation. And this is a bit where, in the context of interpretability, where we will be focusing in particular on explainability, which we define here as the ability to explain the outcomes of an algorithm in understandable ways to a human. So basically, as you can see here, everything has to do with the interaction of machine learning algorithms and humans. So just to give you a bit of an overview, if you look at some uh, statistics, there is plenty of work on machine uh, uh, learning, and in particular on fair and interpretable machine learning in the last few years. Here are some statistics and some plots that I, I, I borrowed from other people. But, in part, but what we will be talking mostly today about is actually on assumptions and as I was mentioning, on the social cost of wrong technical assumptions. So we are, uh, what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna give you a bit of, first of all, a bit of an overview of these two topics, fairness and interpretable machine learning. And then in each of them, I will provide you with an example where uh, in the literature, we were doing for a very long time some assumptions that turn out not to hold that often or in general, and that triggers some problems, mostly at the social, uh, societal uh, perspective. 
So let's start, of course, with unfairness or fairness in machine learning. And as I was uh, mentioning this, uh, when we talk about unfairness or fairness, we talk about discrimination. And, I, and this is the definition I just placed before. And of course, in machine learning, we don't have a whole picture of an individual, but we represent every individual with a set of features, as I divided before, insensitive and non-sensitive. So the first question that may arise is why an algorithm may be, dis may be discriminating towards a different group of people. And just to give you an overview, which doesn't need to be comprehensive, but at least I hope it helps you to get a high general idea on why an algorithm, which in principle is just a, a bit of math and a computer program would discriminate. You can think that first of all, we depend on data. And depending on how we have collected the data, which features that we have selected for, every, for, for representing our individuals, it may easily be that the features that we collected might be less informative or reliable collected for minority groups. And I call them here minority groups because when we talk about discrimination laws, usually we have a protected or a minority group, which is basically um, the, the group of people that historically have been suffering from discrimination. And of course, I, I decided to call them minority group because you can think that if you think that in general they are less represented in our population, Therefore, when we collect the, the features, we might get them less reliable or maybe less informative because we design them to capture well maybe the majority group, the individuals on the majority group, but not on the minority as well. Um, the second one is that, of course, you may get less data from the minority group. And we know by that if we train a classifier by empirical risk minimization, we have some error bounds that actually decrease as we see more data, but this is aggregated over the whole population. And now we are saying, well, we have two groups, majority and minority group. And of course the minority group is under, might be underrepresented in our in our accuracy or in our risk minimization. And therefore we might expect higher errors on that group if you, we train the algorithm as usually we do simply because they add the less to the overall loss of the predictive model. Of course, the next and, and a bit of a, in a different level of uh, perspective is that whenever we have collected that data, this data comes from somewhere and it comes from society. It comes from historical decisions that in our example before the bank uh, was taken. So if there is some human biases in such decisions or some stereotypes, it, they are going to be represented in our data. And if we know that machine learning is good at something, it is at picking up patterns. So if there is such a bias or stereotypes in our data, this is going to be a pattern that it is going to be in general quite easy for the uh, algorithm to pick up. And the next point to be considered is that I said, well, we have non-sensitive features and sensitive features that represent the individuals. And might, one might thought, think of dropping the sensitive feature. This is quite common, for example, when the human is the one making the decision. For example, in the UK, it is quite common to remove any information that can reveal some of your sensitive uh, information from your CV, for example. And that might work in human decision making, but not that well in algorithmic decision making, because basically machine learning is very good or AI in general at finding proxies for this sensitive information. So even though you would then give the sensitive feature, then due to some correlations between uh, the non-sensitive and the sensitive features, you can still be using that information, even if not provided explicitly. And the last one is that the decisions that were made in the past, they might definitely be biased uh, or skewed toward different groups of people. And we might get very poor results that might affect particular um, the minority groups. So the question, of course, just to give you the overview is how do we handle fairness in machine learning? And basically, the first approach that we have um, been tackling for the last uh, 
or quite a few years by now, is actually providing definitions because I gave you a very high level definition of uh, discrimination, but this is something that our methodology doesn't understand. So a lot of the work on fair machine learning has been put on actually providing definitions and measurements that we can actually um, quantify from the observed data. And just to give you a summary, uh, there are the, the initial set of uh, definitions, they were mostly statistical, and basically they consider some sort of independence or conditional um, independence between three random variables, which are the sensitive feature, the target label, and the prediction of the algorithm, and they simply place a different type of conditional independence between them. So if we think of full independence between the sensitive feature and the prediction, this is usually um, one generalization of the well-known um, demographic parity that you might have heard about. Or if you think of a conditional independence between the label and the sensitive feature condition on, on the true label, that is um, the generalization of another definition that was proposed by Moritz Hart on called equalized odds. And we can also take the sufficiency, which is quite usually implemented in any predictive model. And this has been some of the initial definitions, but they suffer all from several problems because they are statistical. So later on, there has been also a bunch of work on proposing more um, causal definitions of fairness. They come also with their pros and their cons. And if you want to have a bit of an overview, I, I recommend you to go to the Fair Machine Learning book as I'm not going to really enter here, but simply to let you know that definitely some of the work that we were doing is actually how to define. And as there is no consensus on what fairness or fair to be fair means in general in society, you also might understand that we don't have a, like a definition of fairness that is universal in the context of machine learning. So different definitions has pros and cons, and they are more suited for some settings than for others, but it is very uh, problem dependent. And of course, um, having the definition is not enough, but also how uh, we ensure fairness in machine learning has captured a lot of attention that comes from this uh, plot that I was showing before. And just to give you an overview, which is not very complete, uh, because there are plenty of papers Basically, there are three main approaches for enforcing that a classifier is fair. The first one is by uh, pre-processing the data so that you remove some information uh, about the sensitive features that is very uh, well suited for independence, for making the label and the sensitive at the prediction and the sensitive attribute independence independent, but doesn't need to completely fit for any other fairness definitions. You can also post-process, you can train normally or almost normally, uh, initially like empirical risk minimization, your classifier, and then correct the outcomes or do a bit of a post-training of the algorithm to correct for the fairness. That is also an option. And the other option where I would say most of us uh, have worked, or at least myself, is that modifying the the training. So in particular, in my case, I've done quite some work at constraining the space of solutions of the algorithm um, to fulfill some fairness constraints according to a given definition. So we try to minimize uh, the loss of the classifier, for example, subject to some fairness constraints. But as I was saying, this is definitely not the, the scope of the talk, this was simply an overview, but actually what uh, we, we care about today is about assumptions. And in this um, last, uh, last few minutes, when I have introduced you to the general concept of fair machine learning, I have actually done quite some implicit assumptions that I haven't really explicitly made. And some of them is, are the ones that we are going to question because uh, actually, as we will see, making these assumptions might not uh, hold in the general case. And these wrong assumptions may indeed amplify unfairness. So 
uh, in the whole talk up to this point, what I was saying is that in general, we have translated the fair decision making into a classification problem where I have uh, features and I try to predict the label of the individuals and I do that based on historical data. So given uh, like um, credit applicants, Basically, I, I look at the people that they got uh, the credit before, I see whether they repaid or not, this is their label, and then I make a, a, a prediction on whether they would repay. And if we look at the fair decision making system um, or setting, we can understand why we transform that problem or the decision making into a predictive problem because actually, the optimal uh, decision policy is a threshold policy where basically I will decide to grant an individual a loan if his or her probability of repaying the loan, which is this why, is greater than the cost of giving the loan. But of course, this decision policy is optimal based on the true probability of an individual repaying the loan. And this is something that we are not, we don't observe. In general, the applicants, they don't come up to your, to, to the bank with a label saying, yeah, I'm going to repay the loan 90% probably. So instead, what in practice we have been doing, and this is why I've been talking so much about predictions, is that we train a predictive model that tries to approximate, approximate this true probability of repaying the loan. Of course, this can be done up to some mismatch. And this mismatch can come, for example, from the fact that we have only finite sample um, sets. But of course, we are also in the prediction setting. So in general, how the pipeline works is that I have collected some data with, uh, that, um, that collects um, tuples of my features, sensitive and unsensitive, and the labels. Then I train some predictive model that I can do to, to minimize the prediction loss. And as I said, I could add also some fairness constraints. I can do in other ways as well. I could pre-process this data and then train the, 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 the classifier. And then once I have this prediction, which as I said, try to mimic the true probability of people to repay, I mimic or I copy that be the behavior of the optimal policy and instead of thresholding the true probability I will threshold uh, my approximation so I would say okay if my if the my estimation of the probability of an individual repaying the loan is greater than my threshold then I grant the loan and if my estimation is below that threshold I deny the loan and then what I do is that I have a potentially imperfect uh, deterministic uh, threshold policy that actually if you look mimic this optimal one, but here I have substituted my true probability by my estimation. But of course, something that we didn't think for a while is actually where the data comes from. Because I've said we, we have data where I collect features and I collect whether the people, the applicants repaid or didn't repay the loan. But that didn't take into account the fact that in order for someone to have the opportunity to repay or doesn't repay or not to repay the loan, you need to grant the loan in advance. But we also know that in general, in the prediction setting, our main assumption is to say that this data is actually IID from the true underlying uh, population distribution. So the first assumption that we are going to question here, it is actually the IID, IID assumption that comes together with the fair prediction setting. And if you think of where the data come from, I already mentioned that, that if I have some historical data, basically there is a population of people 
that are the potential customers of the bank. And then there was some initial policy in place in the bank. I don't think the banks are giving loans or credits completely at random in general. And then they basically, if they did, if they granted the loan, then they get to see whether the individual uh, repaid or default to repay, and then they can build up the data set. If the individual was denied the loan, you can imagine that of course, we don't get to see the label. So this data set that we construct here is actually not an IID uh, realization of, uh, of the true underlying population distribution, but it is actually from a distribution that is somehow induced by this initial policy that was used to collect the data. That means that we may have some sort of bias in how this data collection was. And this problem, which has been initially pointed out in the literature, not that in, in that really statistical terms, is that what it is called the selective labels problem. Because we only get to see the labels for those individuals that we selected to get the loan or the credit. So the first theoretical result that we found is that if you have collected the data with a pi zero, which is different from the optimal policy, and this pi zero was a thresholding policy of the sort that I was mentioning before, where you do make, based on your data, you make a prediction model, and then you threshold that prediction model. If you try to learn a better policy or a better prediction model from that, whatever you learn is going to be suboptimal. And when I say it is suboptimal, I mean, it's not only suboptimal in terms of uh, the predictions that it's going to make, and therefore in terms of the utility for the bank, but they might also amplify unfairness. And it doesn't really matter whether uh, in the family of uh, policies or classifiers um, that you are going to train your optimal policy is there, you, if there is this initial bias in the data, you might not recover because basically you have a, a bias in your data set that you haven't corrected for. And actually, you cannot really correct for that bias because you are making a thresholding on your probabilities. So the problem is that actually, at the moment you have this setting in which your, your data is non-IID, and this turns out to happen in many of the decision-making set, settings uh, that, we, that we have been discussing, doing these two stages of first making a predictive model and then deciding is actually harmful in terms of both utility for the bank, but also in terms of unfairness. So, what we would need to do instead is actually we shouldn't learn to predict, but rather directly learn to decide. And actually, in order for collecting our data, but also in order for improving our policy over time. And why do we need to learn to decide? Mainly because we are going to learn policies which are not going to be policies for decisions that are threshold or deterministic anymore, as we are going to need to make sure that the probability of um, this policy making the positive decision of granting the loan is greater than zero for all the population. By greater than zero doesn't mean to be a very large number, but you at least in order for exploring your population and seeing whether someone is able to repay a loan, you will need to at least grant a loan once in a while to see whether you can see, uh, in order to reveal whether they, they will in fact repay or default to pay the loan. So basically what we are doing is to train instead of predict, uh, predictive models and then thresholding it, we are going to be learning what we call exploring policies, which has, might be stochastic, doesn't need, but the stochastic ones are the more optimal ones, which give a probability of granting the loan to every individual on our population that is greater than zero, or at least that doesn't put zero probability mass in our population of applicants. So, to move a bit away from these very uh, technical points, maybe it's easier if we see in an example. So if you think of the profit 
as the for the bank or the utility of the bank and then you assume that there is an optimal and I call it unfair policy because I haven't corrected for, for fairness. This is the one that you would like to reach and this is the level of unfairness or in terms of equal opportunity or I call it separation as well before. This is where you would like to convert and you would see that because of the IID assumption that doesn't hold, if you do first these thresholding policies when you first predict and then uh, decide, what you can see is actually that you remain suboptimal in terms of profit for the bank, but also you quite amplify the unfairness level that you have in already in your data, which is in your society, let's say. However, if you directly would learn to decide, as I was highlighting before, not really in detail, but happy to discuss more uh, details later, what you can do is that, as because, and this is why we call uh, the, the policies exploring, as you uh, design your policies and implement them, because they explore your whole population, you slowly are able to convert to the optimal policy, both in terms of profit or utility for the bank, and also in terms of um, unfairness level. So just to, to wrap up, everything I mean is that making an idea assumption is a very strong assumption. And such a strong assumption, if you are not careful and or, or if, that, if it doesn't hold there and then your algorithm is trained to make decisions about individuals, you might not be in, not only being suboptimal in terms of the performance of the utility, in terms of the performance of the algorithm for the deployer of the algorithm, but you might also be amplifying the level of unfairness that already exists in your data and your data is collected from society, which is what we see on this right-hand side. So with that, I, I think I can sum up in terms of fairness. Later on, we will see a bit how fairness and interpretability also connect. And I will move to a bit to our second setting where um, we, um, we talk about interpretability. And in particular, I would do a bit the same structure. I will try to give you a bit of a very high level overview so that we all have the same context and then focus on some assumptions and the cost that they may have at the interpretability level. So, why interpretability in machine learning? Well, that depends on many aspects. So if we think of the three different groups that we were talking before, like the, the owner of the algorithm, the, the, the justice system, and the final individuals that are affected by, by these algorithms, of course, they might be interested in interpretability for different reasons. So the owner or the designer of the algorithm might be interested in the features, what features to use, what features are more predictive. In the case of the of the justice system or in general society, we might wonder whether, for example, a sensitive feature might have been used to arrive to a decision and whether this is legal or not. And at the level of the final individual, which is the approach that we are going to take in the next uh, few minutes, they might be more interested in understanding the particular decisions that affect them. For example, if, they, if an individual applied for a loan, um, why didn't um, this individual get the loan and what should uh, he or she do in order to get it next time up that apply? So... Of course, in terms of interpretability, everything also comes at the level of uh, definitions as well. And there are two major trends, one which is more on the transparency, which is understanding the whole functionality of the model as a whole, um, which is more what maybe the designer and the deployer are in general interested. And usually it is thought as an inherent or model interpretability because you try to achieve it um, by design, although there are also post uh, hoc approaches for that. And the other one, where we, which is where we are going to focus, which is explainability, where we try to understand or explain, let's say explain, the particular decisions of an algorithm. So we are not that worried 
about the internal functioning of the algorithm, but more how an algorithm arrives from an input set of features to an output. So if we think of explainability in machine learning and in our particular setting, we can think of the ability to explain the outcomes of the algorithm in understandable ways um, in terms to a human. And here somehow you can see that the same concepts as we were discussing before, like definitions, mechanisms, measures of understandability and the human side, the stakeholders also appear in this setting, although unfortunately in explainability, we don't have such uh, quantifiable me measures or at least not very convincing ones. Um, there are some, but there is not also such of a clear overview as in the concept of fairness. But uh, what we will be doing today is, uh, or next, is to talk about from the perspective or explainability from the perspective of a user, the, where we try to explain why the user or the consumer didn't get the loan and how, sh how should they act in order to get it next time they apply. And in this context, one type of explanations that we could give is, well, you were denied the loan because your salary was $25K. If your salary would have been 30, 30K, you would have been granted the loan. And this type of explanations is actually what in the literature many people call counterfactual explanations. Also, they are sometimes called contrastive to differentiate between causal con counterfactuals and contrastive explanations, but basically at the very high level, these are the kind of uh, explanation that we are, we are looking for. And in this context of um, related and uh, important uh, interest is the concept of algorithmic recourse, which is actually aiming to answer more on the second part of the question, this what should I do? Because it aims to provide uh, the individual with a process, a systematic process to revert an unfavorable decision. So you try to, to give an explanation that the individual can act upon. A con con counterfactual explanation is a bit hypothetical. So you were denied the loan because, if, um, because you were, uh, your salary was 25K. If you would have been then you would have gotten it, right? While in the algorithmic recourse, we care more about on the actionability of these explanations, which is if you will get if you will do this, you will get the loan. So this is a bit of a subtle difference, but maybe if we explain them a bit more in terms of uh, formulation, mathematical formulation, or how they have been placed um, technically, basically what we, while in counterfactual explanations, in general, what most of the literature has focused on is on finding the nearest counterfactual explanation. And this is nothing else than the individual so if we have a given individual that I'm going to call the factual individual with a set of features that didn't go the loan because we have here our uh, classifier and it is on the negative side, we try to find the closest individual to this one according to some similarity metric, some distance that would have caught in the loan. So what is the most similar individual that goes into the other case? So we can phrase that as, a, as a, an optimization problem where basically given our factual individual, we try to find the most similar individual such that the, the, the prediction, the classification in this case is different from the factual. And in addition, we could add some additional uh, constraints, which usually we call plausibility constraints, simply, for example, to ensure that this new individual, this counterfactual individual, is actually in some regions of high density compared to our data distribution. So you want to find a, an individual that somehow is similar to those uh, that you observe in your training data. So this is in the case of counterfactual explanations. And if we look on the, uh, at least the initial uh, formulation of algorithmic recourse, Instead, they shift a bit the focus from finding the most similar individual to actually finding the set of actions at minimum cost that will 
transform you or that will make you become that other individual. And this is exactly why this op original optimization problem is uh, changed by this new one, where now we try to find a set of uh, actions that I'm going to call delta because basically I'm assuming that my new individual, the counterfactual one, is going to be the factual individual plus some delta function. So it's simply assuming that we can, um, we can change our features in an additive way, the features of, that represent the individual. So here we have x1 and x2, so we can move into, into the other side. And we need to define a, a cost function that says how costly it is to perform that shift in your in your um, features is that accounts for example for the fact that you might not be able to decrease your age or change your gender so basically you want to restrict your changes in your features to a subset of feasible actions that is basically uh, the main formulation so how actually people solve these two problems mostly the top one, which is where most of the literature has focused because actually most of the literature has thought that uh, nearest counterfactuals and algorithmic records are simply two versions of the same problem. And you can do a mapping from one to the other directly. It's quite impressive. So there are a couple of, um, of uh, survey papers, uh, recent survey papers, one by our group, one other from, from a group in, in the US, where, as you can see here in the table, we all summarize the different papers that have tried to solve these problems. And as I was saying, this is just out of reference because this is not what I'm going to focus on explaining how to solve these uh, problems before, but actually I will focus on the assumptions that were implicit there and why we need to be cautious about them. So in particular, as we were focusing on individuals and helping them not only to understand, but also to get a more favorable decision in the future if they got, didn't get the decision that they were expecting, the problem of uh, wrong assumptions, as we will be seeing in, in a bit, is that we might be asking for too much effort or useless effort to the individual in order to change um, the situation. And this is definitely not desirable because they are already in an unfavorable situation. So you wouldn't like to, to do that uh, from a societal point of view. So coming back to our, um, our uh, setting where I recall we have our factual individual that is trying to jump into the other side of the boundary and is about to ask how to jump into the other um, side of the boundary. If we reformulate our algorithmic recourse setting, a simplified one, basically we want to find the set of features uh, that a minimum cost will trigger you the, the, the positive decision. So this is simply the setting. And as I was mentioning, this is a very general way, is that most of the papers that we found in the literature in these two very long tables that I just showed you before, what their main assumption is, is that they can intervene or they can manipulate independently on every of the features representing and imputed into our um, classifier. So this is the main assumption. So if we present that in a graphical model way, basically what they have is that they are assuming that they have um, a set of input features to the algorithm. Here we have three. In the plot, we have two because the 3D plotting is not my thing. And basically the implicit assumption is that they, are, they, they claim in the in their it's actually implicit, but in their formulation, they are somehow assuming that they can place an action in each of these uh, features um, independently to, to set it to whatever value. It is desirable so that they get this uh, classification. That is in the context of algorithmic recourse. And just to give you a very high uh, level um, uh, comment is that based on this recourse definition, there has been also proposed uh, some definitions of fairness, which is fairness by equalizing recourse, but that basically try to equalize the average cost or distance or effort 
um, of recourse across protected groups and uh, protected and unprotected groups um, and fixing it to a threshold. So whatever assumption that they are making here in the algorithmic recourse when they consider fairness, in terms of recourse, this uh, assumption is propagating not only from the, to the context of interpretable machine learning, but also on fairness. So basically, this is why um, later on I will be talking not only about uh, recourse or effort for recourse, but also a bit on fairness, because basically this metric of uh, effort or recourse has been also being used for, for fairness. So coming back to our assumption, if I manage to, yeah, the problem that this assumption has, and I believe by now you, I, I should have given spoilers enough, is that this assumption of assuming that I can intervene or act upon in the different variables in an independent way, I call that assumption the independent word assumption, because I'm basically assuming that these variables somehow in this graph are independent of each other. Actually, does not warranty recourse. And that means that even if I propose a set of actions and I really I have solved my optimization problem and my prediction says that I should at, uh, achieve the desirable or the favorable decision, that is not warranted theoretically. And even if it would happen, right? In, even if I propose a set of uh, actions that actually would trigger you to the desirable um, outcome or decision, in general, the set of actions is going to be suboptimal in terms of the cost that they will require from the individual side. And the question is actually why this may happen. And it is because of course, you can imagine that the features that we collect about individuals are not in general independent on each other. So, for example, my salary and my savings are definitely not independent. So it is a bit unrealistic or quite unrealistic to assume that you, you can, I can change my, my salary uh, or my, my savings without changing my salary or at least it doesn't need to apply for everybody. So this is exactly what, what happened if we take a bit of a more causal view on the algorithmic recourse um, po uh, problem, where on the top of having these arrows from the input features to the classifier, which is represented here in a deterministic way, you also assume that there is um, some additional de statistical dependencies between the features that we capture via a causal uh, graphic, a causal um, model that says that, for example, my, my savings uh, depend on my salary. That assumption or this causal view is gonna be important because it is actually the one that uh, help us to show that such an independent world uh, assumption doesn't warranty recourse and if it might be suboptimal. And of course, I'm talking up here about uh, recourse or explainability, but if you do the same assumption for defining fairness in terms of recourse, you can imagine that whatever you have measured in terms of the cost or the actions, the effort that they will need to do in order to achieve recourse, if your estimates are wrong because you didn't account for the fact that my features are, in the, are dependent on each other, basically you might also not achieve any fairness despite of adding a constraint because basically the way you measure might be wrong. So a bit more into the topic, I have a bit of more negative research, which is a bit of bad news, but hopefully I will try to I will try to fix it with a bit of positive by the end of the of the of the talk. And actually it can be theoretically proven that recourse, algorithmic recourse, can only be warranted if the true causal model is known and fully specified. So what do I mean by that? I mean that we don't only need to know how the different features uh, relate to each other, which features are apparent or has a, a parent-children causal relationship between them, but we also need to know the, the, the called um, the structural equations that actually tells you exactly how the features relate with each other and with some uh, unobserved uh, noise variables. 
out exogenous variables. So this is what I mean by the causal model to be known and fully specified that we need to have all this information. Of course, the problem of that is that this, having this information is quite unrealistic because in general, you might have an, in, an intuition on whether my, uh, my, in, my savings relate, uh, depend on my, on my salary, so I'm not in the other way around, but exactly how, what is the functional, the parametric form in which they relate with each other, and what is the noise on the top of that for the whole population of the applicants to the bank, it's quite unrealistic. So, of course, one might think of saying, well, I make some parametric assumptions on how these structural equations uh, are and the graphical model, and I use my data to fit the parameters. But the problem, if you are familiar with the causal literature of that um, approach, is that in general, assumptions on the structural equations, that means these functions here, are usually unstable and would require counterfactual data to confirm or, or refute assumptions. That means that we would need to be able to apply some interventions and collect experimental data in order to recover the structural equations. But of course, we are in the consequential setting. So it is not as simple as we go and we make interventions on the salary of individuals or in their savings. This is something that is, in general, going to be particularly difficult in the case of uh, consequential decision um, making. And of course, if you would also go for, a, for the point estimate, assuming that you would have uh, data enough uh, of, of enough quality, experimental data, it might still be that because of the finite sample and how you have run these experiments, you might suffer from overfitting or misspecification on what is the, the parametric form of these functions. So it's not only a matter of uh, having the right data, but it's also a matter of deciding how we relate these different variables to each other and how to set these parameters. And this is definitely a, an open question in causal inference which is a bit out of the scope of that, but it is in general um, a research problem by itself. So the question now is that we just got two very negative results. We said, well, um, in the past, they have made this assumption where you assume that you can simply touch the different features or change the values of the different features and things will remain as you predicted. And we said, well, this, is, this doesn't guarantee recourse. So it might fail or it might ask for too much effort from the individual. And then I said, well, it is even worse because you need to have full specification of the causal model in order to be able to, to ensure recourse. But of course, we just said that this is very complicated. So the question that I will spend the, the last uh, part of my talk on is actually how can we achieve recourse under realistic assumptions? And by achieving recourse, I also mean measuring recourse if you would be interested in fairness in terms of recourse. So I'm going to try to relax the causal assumptions on on, on that we have or the causal knowledge that we have on our problem. And actually I will propose some, um, some solutions where actually we will try to meet them, uh, minimize our assumptions on the causal model and say, well, we still need to keep the graph, but let's assume that I don't know the structural equations. Is there anything I can do in order for recourse to propose actions for individuals to change uh, the, the decisions that affect them? Um, yes, it is possible, but of course it is only possible up to some uncertainty in a probabilistic way. So instead of saying, of giving answers of the form that we were saying before, if, you will, if your salary will increase by 5%, you will get the loan. Now we will be able to say, well, if you increase your salary by 14%, if you could, of course, that is not usually that easy, your savings are expecting to grow proportionally. And as a consequence, you will get the loan above with 90% probability. So we cannot fully ensure recourse in a deterministic way, but at least we can compute um, some confident intervals 
about how likely you are to get the desirable uh, decision if you, perf if, if you perform an action. And in order for doing that, uh, we are going to see two, uh, two different approaches where we relax differently our assumptions, but in none of them, we know the exact parametric form or parameters of the structural equations. We have some assumptions on the causal graph and some further assumptions about uh, these exogenous, we call them usually exogenous or noise um, uh, and, and observed noise variables. So, in the first approach that we are going to study, we call it the individual recourse or probabilistic recourse because basically uh, we are going to keep our causal graph. We are also going to uh, assume that we have causal sufficiency. That simply means that if I have these noise variables that affect how uh, it is the noise that affect um, each of the individual variables, I'm assuming that they are independent on each other. So I'm assuming that the noise that affects X1 is independent of the noise that affects X2 or the noise that affects X3. This is a causal sufficiency, or basically, in other words, we are saying that there are no hidden confounders. And in the first approach, the only assumption I'm going to do about the structural equations is to say that the noise that affects each of these variables is additive. So somehow we have a function and then we have some additive uh, noise. And this noise is gonna be Gaussian. So what we can do under these assumptions is actually to place a Gaussian process prior over um, our uh, structural equations and use that to actually integrate that over an infinitely number of structural functions as long as they are smooth. So basically, what we are doing is to place a Bayesian prior over these functions under the assumption that the noise is additive and Gaussian and the functions are smooth with respect to how they relate with the different variables. And if that case, what, what we can do is actually, and this is where the probabilistic recourse um, happens, is that we had our factual individual and basically we map this individual into a cloud that with for example, 90% probability falls on the other side of the boundary. And why we cannot do a one-to-one -one mapping is because nothing is deterministic anymore, of course, because we are integrating out the uncertainty that we have about our structural equations. And by doing that, of course, if our structural equations were the optimal ones, we will deterministically end up in the in the causal counterfactual, which is here. But if we would have some sort of mismatch or because we don't know, you can end up anywhere here. But we have integrated out all this information that we don't know about the structural equation using the Gaussian um, process. And the second approach, which is a, at a different level where we relax even further our assumptions, actually we see we remove any assumption on the Gaussian on the noise. So now it doesn't need to be additive or Gaussian, but we only assume that there is a causal sufficiency so the noise affecting each of my variables, observed variables is independent on each other. Then what we can actually do is to do another type of probabilistic recourse approach, but where instead of mapping this individual into a cloud, we can now map a set of individuals close to our original individual. They share a set of features to another cloud. This is why we call it at the subpopulation based because right now, because of the real, like the assumptions that we can make, basically we don't know exactly how to map one individual to to the other side, but simply a set of individuals that share a subset of features while we intervene on some others and the descendants of these others kind of propagate. So what I mean is that basically, if I would, I, I could um, intervene on X2, right? X1 would be the same for the individual. So that would be the, depending on my population. I intervene on X2, I fix a value and this new value of X2 will affect X3. And this is what the uncertainty I will need to propagate because I don't exactly know how this arrow from X2 to X3 goes. Okay. 
So just to give you a bit of more details, in the individualized reports that I gave you at a very high level, basically I'm assuming that uh, my exes, each of my ex is a function of its parents plus some additive Gaussian noise. So X3 is a function of X1 and X2 plus some additive uh, Gaussian noise. And what I'm assuming is that this function that I don't know this structural equation, I don't know exactly what the parameters or the shape of FR is. So I'm gonna place a Gaussian process over it with some kernel function. I'm gonna assume that my additive noise is Gaussian. And by doing this assumption, what I can do is to use the Gaussian process to get an estimate of my posterior overview given the data I have observed. And I can do that to integrate out all the specific form of FR. And in that way, I can simply solve the probabilistic individualized recourse optimization problem by basically minimizing the set of actions. Now I call them here actions instead of delta because we are intervening on a causal graph. So we are intervening on a causal graph also means breaking up some of these dependencies, these arrows here. And basically we want to find the set of action at minimum cost subject to, in expectation, the output of my classifier after I perform these interventions, I get my counterfactuals, is greater than a threshold. And this threshold, I can fix it to, to be a, a, like a value, a particular value, which is fixed in advance. Or I can also put some uh, confident interval that depends on how uh, the variance of of my prediction. And by playing with that, I basically can compute actions with some confident interval that with whatever probability will ensure that indivi an individual will cross the border if perform an action. So this is the first approach, but of course you can imagine that this plus UR, this additive Gaussian noise is a quite of an assumption because in the consequential decision making, we usually have features of individuals and many of them are socio-demographic. So imagine that one of the, your features is your um, education level. So in the education level, we cannot definitely treat it as Gaussian. And this makes this approach to be a bit over restrictive in our setting. So the second approach relax these assumptions and it is based on maybe you are familiar with that on conditional average treatment effect because it simply look at if I perform an intervention of this cause on this causal graph for a subpopulation of people, how my, um, my outcome, my prediction my decision changes. And it is usually called conditional average treatment effect because it has been broadly used in the context of the medical domain to, to see what is the effect or, of a drug in a population, for example, for clinical trials. Uh, in our case, it's a bit different, but we can use the same to say, well, if I look at individuals that are similar to to my fact one individual and they perform an action, how likely they are to, to cross the border. And in that way, we can, uh, first of all, we can rely on density estimators to simply capture the relationship between parent and children here. We don't, we don't need, as long as we have the causal graph, we can do estimates on how um, my each of my variables depend on its parents after integrating out the noise, which is unknown. And for that in particular, we use conditional variation autoencoders, but you could use other regressors. We simply use conditional variation autoencoders because they are quite expressive. And then what we can do is that because we know that the descendants, the probability of the or the distribution of the descendants of the variables I intervene upon. So if I intervene upon an X2, the descendant is X3. Condition on the non-descendant values, this would be X1 and the new value that I set on X2, which is the one I intervene upon, this simply factorizes as in a sequential way from parents to children. And I can use that property to place my recourse problem as the set of action minimizing the cost of A, that in expectation for now this population of people, 
if perform an action would cross the boundary. And again, we can put this threshold to be simply a threshold which is invariant to the uncertainty, but you can also uh, keep in mind the, the confidence lower bound and say, okay, depending on how certain I am, I can make it depend also on the variance of my prediction. So this is basically what I wanted to tell you from the technical point of view. I have maybe some results which are not that important, I would say, so I'm gonna skip through them simply to let uh, these results just for a quick summary. They are telling you the pros and the cons. So the pros is that probabilistic approaches as, as they account for uncertainties in your causal model, they are much more robust than point estimates. That if I try to fit my, uh, my structural equations based on some parametric form, because at the moment I have a mismatch between uh, the true structural equation and the assumptions that I make, everything tends to break. And the second is that between individualized and subpopulation based is that the individualized one, they in general give you a lower cost for the individuals, but at the price of making a stronger assumption. So we come back to the same problem as before, that if your assumptions hold, you are good to go. If your assumptions don't, you everything can happen. While in the other case, in the case of the subpopulation, it is a bit more effort that you will need to do in order to uh, ensure recourse or to have a high probability of recourse, because basically, you are doing things at the a subpopulation level, so not one individual, but similar individuals to that original one. But the results are usually consistent because basically the assumptions are more relaxed. So just to some take home messages, if we got if some of you got lost in some of the other in some of the theoretical or technical details is that first of all, for ethical machine learning, and in particular here, we talk about fairness and interpretability, but I believe this extrapolates to almost everything. We need to bear in mind the assumptions because usually wrong assumptions come at a very high societal cost. So we have seen an example where we can amplify unfairness and we have also seen another example where we might be asking for too much effort or useless effort to individuals or if we would do this assumption for fairness in recourse, we would come up again with the same problem of unfairness or amplification. So before you start developing your methodology, May, uh, consider what assumptions you are making and try to make them explicit to avoid these problems. The second is that, of course, assumptions start with the data collection process. So what features you collect? Where, wh what is the distribution of your data? Is, it the, is there a mismatch between the data distribution and the true underlying population distribution? whether there is a feedback loop between the algorithm and the data, this is key and this makes a difference. So whenever you start with your design, start with the data. And as we saw, for example, in terms of causality, you, even the features and the relationship between the features that you collect might make a difference later on. So try to have a, an overview of everything. The, the next point that I would like to mention, and this one might be a bit biased because of my background, which is quite probabilistic, is that in general, the solution that at, at least I find to solve some of these problems, whenever I don't know something, my approach is very probabilistic. There might be others, but it turns out to work quite well for me. So what I don't know, can I integrate it out or can I account for, for it in a probabilistic way? And in order to relax my assumptions and have a bit of more certainty or control on the results I will get. And here we have seen that both in these exploring policies, which at the end of the day are also stochastic and have some probabilistic flavor in it, and also on the probabilistic recourse uh, example. And finally, I think by now it is quite clear, but remember to have a holistic view on 
the algorithm are on the whole pipeline because something is not because something seems technically possible or easy. It is the right thing to do. And I, this is uh, an example from last uh, summer where there was this uh, open letter to the Springer editorial because basically there was an article about to get published that they wanted to predict criminal risk of people based on pictures of their face. And well, they were claiming that their system was fair basically because they added some fairness constraints. I would argue against that. In general, I'm not sure whether this is a direction that we would like to go as a society, whether we want to predict criminal risk just for our face. So with that, I conclude, and I'm more than happy to take, I don't know, all these questions, hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have some applause for you. I hope you can hear it. <laughs> so they stop sharing? Yes, you can stop sharing. Yeah, I think this was a really a great talk. And uh, in particular, imagine the counterfactuals for the face detection. And then the counterfactual recommendation is like get a haircut cut, or wear makeup or something like that. <laughs> Something is so definitely there. Yeah, I'm I'm completely um, convinced that this is the right way to go. That there are just some technologies that uh, we probably don't want to see in practice. I completely agree with that, and also the you know the the killer drones and stuff like that. I I don't think that people should build that because they they would be probably also very easy to build an authoritarian regime with kind of these technologies. Imagine you you just fiddle in in the database and you buy, uh, build in the right the right or the, the wrong priors, uh, then you could probably just get rid of a lot of people. Um, so I think this has a, a huge risk. So Thank you. This was really a great talk. And I think you, you brought up also very important, um, yeah, very important points here in the discussion. So I think this is, this is great. And we have a lot of questions here. And one of the first questions that came up is, um, so in addition to ethical uh, AI or ethical machine learning, do we have to create the system such that they are like fail safe? So shouldn't we able to appeal a loan decision, or I must say, uh, this is one of my questions, actually, a, a friend of mine, he just registered at the beginning of the pandemic to Facebook, and he already had a Twitter account where he was using the same profile picture, and his account on Facebook was blocked. He didn't have one before the pandemic, and it was blocked in perpetuity without repeal because he was using the same picture as on his Twitter account, and this was a clear case of identity theft and he can't appeal that decision. It was already verified by a human decision and there's no way to appeal it. And then, I, come on, this, this should be possible. I mean, th this is most likely an automatic decision, maybe not even AI, but just simply a simple rule-based system. But I think for some stuff, we just need decisions to appeal and maybe without going to court. Yeah, I guess definitely. So one of the key questions is when and how to use um, algorithmic systems. And I believe this is a very hard question in general and how to implement human supervision, right? Because mostly here we have been talking about algorithms that make predictions or decisions. We haven't directly talked about how they collaborate with the human. But definitely in order for doing that, we need to establish communication between the two sides. And this is where the interpretability comes from, but definitely what part to explain, what part not to explain, and also the regulation part. Um, I guess um, Twitter or Facebook, they are implementing their own policies uh, that they decide, so they have full control on everything. And of course it is a private company, but on the other hand, it is a private company of public use. So I guess a lot of people are trying to decide on how to regulate, but regulating is very complicated. And we, I think we can see that a bit with the privacy issues because now we, we accept cookies every single day. 
I would argue that maybe this was not the most, uh, the best way we could have regulated our privacy because most of the people I know, they accept all. Or you go and do the essentials, but what even the essential cookies means is not clear. So regulation is an open question. And I guess we need a bit of more discussion uh, between uh, the different parts. And I think the technical side, which is the one I've been talking today, is just one. And it is on our hands to develop a bit of the tools that allow a more informed communication with other regulators, but this is definitely necessary. I don't think also we as technical people, machine learning, we should be making these decisions either. So we definitely need some sort of regulation. What is the right way of implementing? Well, I, I think there is not a clear consensus. There is also this white paper from the EU on regulating AI. I read it a couple of times. I still not sh not sure whether this is the right way to go. Also, there are a lot of critical uh, points about it. It's a bit difficult. I don't have an answer, but definitely, I think we need to have this discussion and we need to have it in a more explicit or transparent way. I think that's a very good point. I think these discussions have to be be done in a in a broad public because this will affect a lot of people and they should have a say in this. I mean, this is also true for upload filters and, and other things that come just with huge implications on society, how it is today. And in particular, when we are going through the lockdown and everything is going digital, suddenly some technologies are much more important than they used to be. So it, I completely agree with this. Um, I have I have a question here um, about learn to decide. So the the power that you are essentially harnessing here is that the prior might be unfair and um, therefore it might be uh, altering the distribution such that uh, some of the possible good decisions are never made because they could never be observed because they were already filtered out prior to that. So I think, as far as I understood your presentation, this is where the, the power comes from, that you can suddenly get much better by learning to decide because you're not bound to the, to the prior that is already ongoing there. So, But if you already have a very good, uh, let's say an optimal unfair baseline, do you, do you think that then you can still um, uh, harness this or is then thresholding and regulate? So, so will you also see this benefit? So I guess theoretically, it as long as um, I mean, as and unless you are already in the optimal solution that you are looking for, and you don't want to move away from that, and you assume that it, it is optimal according to the true population, um, that is okay. At the moment, you have a mismatch, or you have only observed finite data, and maybe there were some regions in the space that you never saw. Uh, definitely you are always going to need to go for um, learning to decide. And this, of course, triggers the problem of making a bit up to some extent random decisions or a bit of stochastic decisions and how we embed that into society, right? Because it, people wouldn't like to go to the bank and say, well, your probability of getting accepted was 90%, we flipped the coin and and you got out, right? So this is a bit of a problem that we need to discuss. But in general, um, it is very hard in very, comp it depends on your distribution, but it is very hard in your complex settings to threshold something and make sure that you didn't miss out any region of the space. So for example, what there is always in, I think when you are an immigrant in a new country, usually you don't have a credit score. And here in Germany, there was this Shufa. And for me, the first time I moved here, getting an apartment was very difficult because it was a prerequisite, but I didn't have any record. So, but at the same time, they didn't give you the opportunity. So you cannot build up this record. So you depend on somehow getting away of someone supporting you to get an apartment and then start building up your record. But this 
this is kind of the hard decision, right? This is the threshold, no sofa, no, no record. And then how do you, how do you handle like new incomers to the country? So I guess there is no, uh, theoretically in general, there's not going to be a clear way of recovering from that than allowing these people new incomers to get the apartment without the sofa. Yeah, yeah, this reminds me of a very interesting story. When I filed in the US for my first credit card, it, it was this it declined because I didn't have a credit history. And then he just told me, just file again. And then it was approved because I had a credit history where I had a declined credit card. In. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so very interesting uh, things that are going on there. So you're yeah, absolutely right. Um, <laughs> So this this also we are facing these problems every day in review, aren't we? Because you know you give review and you give feedback and then you kind of do a counterfactual explanation in the review. You say, okay, maybe you add this experiment and maybe you do some more work on this and elaborate on this, but you probably can't guarantee that if they do that and it goes to a different reviewer it will be accepted or not so you can also say this will increase the likelihood of being accepted but <laughs> we kind of have these counterfactual probabilistic counterfactual explanations already don't we I, definitely and even also somehow the stochastic decision so if you would be um if you would apply um the inst uh, to something and the the scissor was a human, but maybe instead of one one of the employees, it would be a different one. Maybe the outcome would be different. But somehow, I guess it's a bit difficult to make sure. Or it's it doesn't feel the same when the stochasticity comes from an algorithm that people don't think maybe that the algorithm should work at the stochastic level that from humans because somehow you already have trust in humans. Or when you go to the doctor and they explain to you, of course, they never explain in all the details or they also have gut feelings, right? So it is, they and they experience it and they don't transfer the whole uh, information. And they, of course, there is a bit of a, a like randomization there because one doctor will diagnose you or give you a treatment different than another doctor, even though similar. So, but somehow in the concepts of, Algorithms is something that we still, probably because of a problem of trust, we still, I, I see people being reluctant to all this probabilistic. And if you think of reviewing systems, most of the people, what they com complain the most about is about how random the process is. Maybe more random than it could be with an algorithm, but. Yeah, yeah. Some, if you if you think of the doctor, then also people just switch the doctor if they get recommendations that they don't like. So, you know, I recommend that you lose twenty kilos, and then they said, "Okay, this is infeasible. Let's let's go to a different doctor." <laughs> um, so, just just a joke, of course. Um, there's another question um, here. The unfairness in a machine learning model can occur anywhere from the data acquisition to annotations to predictions. In your opinion, how can we address this in a more structured way in an organization, let's say for a company deploying AI in products? So then this is related to a different question that's coming here. Um, is do we need something like a, a clinical trial to produce these uh, AI ethical AI systems? Do we need branding? Do do we need something like that, or is there other good strategies to deploy such systems? I guess this is a very good question. I've been wondering myself around for a lot of time. Uh, I, to be honest, even myself, I keep changing a bit on my own. Uh, on my own opinion, I definitely think that uh, having a bit more structured protocol on on from the data collection to the deployment, what you have measured, what you haven't measured is important. And even from the data collection, right? First, when when you like auditing yourself during this design. So when you do the data collection, you, you may also wonder whether a feature is acceptable to be used for a particular decision. 
like we were saying before, making criminal, uh, criminal uh, risk assessment based on pictures, maybe not socially the, the ideal. Then with the algorithm, maybe um, you need to, I'm moving more and more towards more explicit systems where basically we define what instead of working, for example, with prediction, we work with the bank utility, what they want to optimize for, right? And maybe you also measure um, the, the other things, like for the consumer's goals, like maybe how much interest they are going to pay. They, they want to minimize that. And maybe from the societal level, maybe we want to measure not only discrimination, but something more on the level of uh, diversity how 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 is q this our acceptance distribution compared to the applicant distribution things like that so i'm becoming more and more uh, towards being more explicit and of course it's never going to be able to assure that you are perfect or that you didn't miss out anything but if you have a process which is much more explicit and say well this is why i collected this data how i collected this is how i train this is what i measure these are all the objective functions or the all measurements that i care about and still something can go wrong but uh, but this will this having much more a systematic process i believe will allow everybody to better understand and do a bit of an iterative process where you, if something goes wrong or if, if, if you design everything but you are not quite convinced, you can start over again and revisit the different steps that you made very, very explicit. In terms of clinical trials, this is a hard question. I have, um, it's a bit complicated, but I believe that maybe for some applications, it might indeed make sense. Um, but how to define them, how to, uh, right now we are a bit blind because some of these assumptions are very uh, implicit and actually how the algorithms also work is also quite difficult. So it's a bit difficult to really have measures uh, that of success measures, let's say, or in risk measures. So I guess all comes back to the original. Only when we make every, all the process much more explicit, it's gonna be much easier to do uh, a clinical trial or some sort of auditing. Absolutely, and it also depends on the, the risk that is and the harm that is potentially done by a system. And what I, what I really liked about your presentation is how you emphasize that you have to have the right constraints and that you have to think about uh, which constraints to set and how to select them. Because if, you, if you're not very good at selecting a constraint, it may cause the, the actual optimization to result in something that you're not expecting. So it could, for example, introduce unreasonable cost. Um, in Let's say you, you want autonomous driving and you say that it should never harm children then this may come at the cost that it may harm other people <laughs> and even many more than you. It's in this ethical example, they have, yeah, should, should it kill the child or the old woman or whatever? Yeah. But it, it could be that you introduce something like this and then you're, you're, you're not killing a single child, but you're killing hundreds of elderly people. <laughs> and did, you didn't notice when you introduced this constraint. So, <laughs> It's definitely a very hard question. And this is why, um, I, I mean, definitely it's society, I'm moving more and more towards more of a society perspective. And we different, we play different roles. We saw it also in the presentation. We play different roles depending on the scenario in society. And if, depending on the on the role, we, co we have different considerations or goals. And in general, there is going to exist a compromise between them because this is societal decisions that we need to make. And in that way, I think we definitely need to, to try to, to represent everybody affected, all the stakeholders involved in a process, trying to make much more explicit what are the, um, the harms that they foresee, what are the goals that they are trying to achieve, and how we can try to put everybody in line and then design the whole system according to, to that discussion and in a collaborative fashion. I would like us definitely to move a bit from the current state, which is we first do, then we see the, the, the bad side, and then we try to fix it. 
I would rather start from the other way around and say, well, this is what we want to do. What things would do we foresee? How do we try to mitigate and how we create, create a systematic and iterative process so that eventually maybe we can have some sort of agreement or some sort of um, level of trust that the things are going to work as expected or at least are not going to harm anybody. Yeah. Absolutely. No, there are some systems that are likely to harm people at some point. Like the, I mean, if accident free autonomous driving is, uh, of course, something we would like to have. But as soon as you have interactions with like human people on, on the street, and there's, there's some behavior that's just very risky, and accidents will happen. And Yeah, I, it, this is, this is a very, very difficult field. And I must say, I'm I think already ethics is uh, is very hard to deal with, and if you if you think about all the ethical challenges that we're facing today, and in particular now in the time of the pandemic, it's it's super hard, and uh, then integrating this into into feasible and good AI systems, this is even harder. <laughs> So uh, absolutely, um, my respect, you're, you're doing really great research. I really enjoyed your presentation. And I'm, I'm very glad that we had you here as an invited speaker. So thank, thank you, you very much. much for the presentation. I have another round of applause for you, wait. <laughs> thank you. Thank we'll you very stop. much. So you've seen we had a vivid discussion. Ethical machine learning and ethical AI is a huge topic. There are lots of discussions going on. And what I particularly liked about her presentation is also that the technical perspective is also very challenging. And of course, if you work on this topic, you cannot leave aside all the societal implications that come with this very complex topic. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation and of course, as always, if you have any additional questions, remarks or want to get in contact with us, please leave a comment to this video or you can also contact us on social media and if you have any questions, I will forward them to Isabel. So thank you very much for watching this video and I'm very much looking forward to seeing you in one of the next videos back in beyond the patterns. Bye-bye. <laughs>